Chapter 3. Financial Decision Making. A good decision is one where the benefits outweigh the costs. So if you want to compare various decisions as to which machine to buy, whether to buy now or not to buy, whether to install new capacity, each of these decisions should be compared. When you compare them, you need to compare them on the same unit. So that's the key. Compare on the same unit of time, compare on the same unit of currency, same level of risks. So when we compare in all of them in terms of value of dollar today, then we can actually do apples to apples comparison. Otherwise, if we compare $10 today with $10 in the future, then that's that doesn't make sense. Or if you compare $10 of a stock investment with a $10 of a bond investment, that doesn't make sense because the risks are different, the time unit is different, and if you compare $10 with 10 pounds, that makes no sense. So that's the key to remember that we need to use the same unit of comparison when you make decisions. So the way you value something today, the valuation principle, is by using the price of goods today in a competitive market. This is a really good way. If you know, if you have a competitive market, you know the price of goods today and you can calculate in terms of dollars today. So that is a valuation principle. You can value something as of today because you know you are in a competitive market. There is a price for every good and service. You can actually use that as the starting point. Time value of money is an important concept because a dollar today is greater than a dollar a year from now, right? Because you can use, let's say, um, the money that you have and you can put it in a bank and that can give you a risk-free rate of return. And let's say you get 10% return for the $100 you have today, you can make $10 more in a year from now. So $100 today is equal to $110 from from a year from now. So if you wanna say, I'll give you $100 today versus I'll give you $110 a year from now, they are the same. Because you would have gotten the same money if you would have put the money in the bank. So RF is the risk-free market interest rate, which is basically saying, if you were to put this money in the bank, how much would you get? Uh, because r banks are risk-free. So that gives you a really good concept of time value of money. So a dollar today is greater than a dollar from a year from now. Okay, so present value is the present value of cash flows. And net present value is present value of benefits minus present value of costs. So if benefits outweigh the costs, then we have a good investment. Remember, an asset is nothing but a claim on cash flows. So if you have cash flows, you can easily calculate present value. And a good project is any project that has NPV greater than zero. So net present value, if you can calculate benefits minus cost, and if you can calculate the present value of meaning the same currency, then you can have this rule of NPV decision rule, which says pick the project with the highest NPV. And if you add that to the separation principle, which basically says how you fund your investment should be different than whether you fund the investment. Whether you fund the investment should be based on the NPV. If it has a positive NPV, you will fund the investment. And how you fund, whether you have money now or if you're gonna borrow, that's a separate decision. So you should separate whether you borrow and fund the decision or whether you use your existing cash flows because a security transaction, right? Which is basically saying, I'm gonna raise money through equity or I'm gonna raise money through debt, creates no value, really creates no value. It is basically anyone, as long as you can borrow, you should be able to fund a project that's good. So separate whether you would, whether it's a good project or a bad project based on NPV and whether you fund it, how you fund it, based on your current cash flows or from borrowing based on security transaction, right? So anyone with a good project idea should be funding the project. That's the key learning from separation principle. Arbitrage opportunity is basically saying that, hey, you can buy low in one market and sell the same quantity and same good instantly without taking any risks at a higher price. 
If you can do that without taking any risk, then you have an arbitrage opportunity. A lot of people, including myself, before I read this chapter, I always felt that there is always an arbitrage opportunity. For example, if a stock is constantly going up, that it will continue to go up. Let's say you notice a trend where a stock goes up. Well, you think it's an arbitrage opportunity, but it's actually it's not. Because it's the same as saying, I found $100 lying down on a pavement. Think about this. First of all, $100 is too high for someone to lose because they'll keep it carefully. But let's say they did did lose it, which was rare. But then even rare is that someone else didn't, didn't notice it and that you notice it. So if you notice a trend where the stock is going up, most likely a lot of people have noticed it. So a lot more people have jumped into buying that stock or a security. So remember, there is no arbitrage opportunity in life. There is normal competitive market, then there is no arbitrage opportunity. But investment is all about finding arbitrage. I think when Warren Buffett is actually investing, he's finding out that, hey, these cash flows are much more positive. Uh, and uh, my NPV calculation shows that this is positive, so I'm going to go buy. So in reality, stock investment is an arbitrage opportunity. You buy low and sell high. So that's that's the key, right? Um, but in a competitive market, instantly, if you buy and sell, then there is no arbitrage opportunity. Because what happens is, because of law of one price, let's take this example. If you have $100 um, worth of gold, let's say you can buy one gram in New York, and you can sell it at $200 in London, the same one gram, and if this can be sold instantly, then you would buy in New York and you would sell in London, right? And so what, when, when, when you notice it, many more people will notice it. And when so many more people notice it, then the demand goes up. When the demand goes up, the price goes up, right? We know through microeconomics, when the demand goes up, price goes up. Similarly, here, more and more suppliers will dump their gold in London. When, when they start supplying more and more gold in London, more supply, price goes down. So eventually, this price goes down and this price goes up and eventually they settle at like 150 or something. So basically, law of one price is, is what helps you. It helps you to notice that equivalent goods will trade at the same price in a competitive market, right? So arbitrage opportunity doesn't exist in a market when you buy and sell instantly, but if you buy and hold for a long period of time to have your investment thesis pay out, that's what Warren Buffett's doing. He's not arbitraging every day, he's buying and selling, he's buying and holding for those new long-term investments because he understands this piece, that security transaction doesn't create value. It's investments, it's long-term, uh, operational efficiency, it's about growing the product, that's what creates value. So he holds, because that's needed to grow your investments. Okay, so there is no arbitrage opportunity for a security. Huge, right? As long as the present value of all its cash flows, as long as the security is tra trading at the present value. But if the security is trading under, then there is an arbitrage opportunity. If Warren Buffett thinks that, hey, there is an opportunity where the future cash flow is going to be much higher, then he sees a clear arbitrage and he's going to buy it. But there is a price at which there is no arbitrage, right? And that price is where you, the security ideally should be trading, but typically it trades above or below it. So that's where you need to find out what is your calculation of whether this is a good investment or not. So we've covered valuation principle, which basically says, we can use the current market price today to determine the value of cost and benefit. And that helps us with the NPV, which we saw earlier, right? And so finance, right? Finance comes at the crux of, you see, marketing decisions, accounting decisions, economics decisions, strategy decisions, operations decisions, they all flow into finance. Why? Because marketing would, would probably come up with an initiative that increases revenue, has a higher forecast. Accounting could, could help with restructuring some of uh, our current company set up to have better tax savings. Economics can define that, hey, there is this higher demand. A strategy can help us with this decision. Competitors' response would be this. Operations can say, hey, we could have cost savings due to this modernization. So each of these things are decisions. And each of these flow into finance. And so you can look at each of these decisions and say, hey, which one of these is a good decision? And you can do cost-benefit analysis. So that's where finance comes in. It, it looks through each of these um, strategies 
from strategy, operations, economics, accounting, marketing, and says, hey, which one of this is a better decision to take? And it uses NPV for that. Discount factor is one upon one plus RF, where RF is the risk-free rate of return. It helps us to convert future value to present value. We saw that, right? We need to convert and use the same currency. We need to use the same time. We need to seize the same unit, same risks. So that's where we need to discount. Discount is basically saying, how am I going to convert my uh, present value to my future value? So if you want to convert your present value to future value, you multiply by one plus RF. RF is the percentage. So if in this case, if it is 4% risk-free return, you add by one plus 0 0.04. So that would give you the future value. If you want to convert to fut from future value to present value, you divide by one plus RF. So that gives you a way to have it in the same currency. Either you talk in the present value or you talk in the future value. Going back, all risk-free investments should return the same return, right? Because there is no arbitrage. We saw that. Now, let's take a look of this new concept. Is everything risk-free in the real world? Probably not, right? There is always risk. So comparing with RF doesn't make sense because think about this, $1,000 today with certainty is greater than $1,000 on an average. It says, hey, if you invest on an average, you make $1,000. But here it says on an average, you make 1,000, but here it says you make 1,000 by certainty. You feel that this is a better choice, right? Because you are certain. So the difference is the risk, right? And there is also this psychological aspect of risk aversion where a $300 lost on a bad market feels really bad and it cannot really compensate you for that same $300 coming back in a good market. You still feel like you've lost something more, even though net-net you are zero. So losing 300 in a bad market feels much worse than losing than gaining that same 300 in a good market. So that is where risk aversion comes in. And that's where people will demand risk premium to invest in a riskier asset where the probability is of getting money on an average versus certainty. So expected risk premium is basically expected return of a risky investment minus risk-free rate of return. So let's say market gives you 10% on a risky return. Let's say this is a risky return. It gives you 10%. The risk-free is 4%. So the risk premium is 10 minus 4, 6%. So basically, risk premium is what you can demand for a risky investment. So if you invest in stock markets, you can expect a risk premium from the stock market investment. So similarly, then for any risky investment, we should be discounting not using RF alone, which is risk-free. We should discount using RF plus risk premium because that gives us the clear value of uh, what is that cash flow worth. Similarly, we cannot evaluate a security's risk in isolation because if you have insurance in your portfolio, it can, it can help you with, uh, with this risk aversion aspect. It can help you sleep well at night because if you have insurance, then it, its uh, movement is going to be in the opposite direction of the market. So if you have insurance, that actually counters the stock market movement then you're actually better off because you can stay in the market much longer and your risk aversion aspect, the psychological aspect is taken care of. So basically insurance is also good in that sense that it helps you stay in the market, sleep better. And so when you evaluate a security's risk, you need to evaluate it in, in the full picture, in full basket of portfolio instead of just one at a time. So each of these pays, right? So hopefully this was helpful where we, we made good financial decisions with uh, looking at NPV directly, um, making sure that all of the valuation is in the same unit. We, we separate whether we should fund it and how we should fund it as two different decisions. We learned about arbitrage opportunity as a non-existent in a competitive market. And we learned through an example how finance comes in helpful for us to make decisions between each of these decisions and that risk is something that we should factor in as well and not risk-free rate alone, All right? Thanks.